Matt Harrison is the president of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod. Uh, we have worked uh, closely together uh, with an LCMS uh, group uh, in Free to Be Faithful. Uh, we uh, wanted to wait until November to bring together the questions of theology, the two kingdom uh, theology as it relates, uh, relates to uh, public policy and the way that we as Lutheran Christians think about it. Good morning, uh, President Harrison, and thank you so much for joining us. You really uh, grace us and honor us with your presence this morning, and we really look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Tim. It's great to be with all of you today. It's really a very interesting moment in many respects. We now have three times as many LCMS senators in the Senate, or we'll have come January. We had just a couple of weeks ago, Ben Zoss from Nebraska was elected, also Corey Gardner from Colorado. So these are interesting times for us in the Missouri Senate. Uh, at the very time when nation has increasingly made choices on moral issues that are contrary to natural law and the scriptures, and we face the challenge of increased difficulty state law on the operations of the church and our institutions, nevertheless we have opportunities and possibilities for connection. I should mention in this regard that we are getting very close to opening the office of offers policy in D.C. It will be a modest office, the health funding, and it's going to be a great effort that we can bear witness to dogma. And we can also be in touch with people on the Hill uh, to share our views, and especially in touch with associates and colleagues all over the country who are watching religious freedom issues state by state. So it's going to be exciting. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting very, very close. Uh, some years ago, I was in Indonesia visiting with the Batak Church there. It's a church of about four and a half million, which had strong Lutheran roots. And I was struck by my counterpart, who at the time was the head of their diaconia, or mercy ministries, I was struck by his deep interest in Martin Luther's doctrine of the two kingdoms. And as he talked to me about these issues and his deep desire to know everything he could about it, it made sense because he was living in the most populous Islamic country, populous Muslim country in the world, Indonesia. And Islam pushes for a one kingdom doctrine. That's why we hear about Sharia law all the time. We will, many fronts, not only from the rise of Islam, which is certainly rising in the United States, we will be pushed from many quarters on how we understand the state, to what extent we can participate in etc. And so, of uh, asked to speak a little louder, we are going to be pushed on many sides on our participation in the state, and as things become more and more complex on marriage issues, for instance, there will be people among us in our fellowship, in the, the Orthodox Lutheran Fellowship, who will have different ideas and different ideas on conscience as to how far they can or cannot participate in certain things. Many have mentioned already the issue of whether the church should be involved in being an agent of the state in marriage. Serious question that we should deal with. In light of all that, I thought I would go ad fontes. Really behooves us at this moment to grab hold of and to come clear on precious gift that we have been given by the Lutheran Reformation. And that is biblical teaching of the two kingdoms. And I've been trying to deepen my own understanding of this teaching, and slowly the fog has been lifting. You'll determine whether or not it's lifted uh, very high yet uh, after this session this morning. I want to talk about it for about 
you know, 15, maybe a little more uh, minutes, and then we can turn to Tim for questions, either uh, historical questions or contemporary questions on our context. There are, there are a number of documents that are just very helpful in this uh, quest. I would recommend from Concordia Publishing House this book by Martin Luther. Uh, it's the political writings of Luther, Divine Kingdom, Holy Order. And there are numerous segments of documents and major documents by Luther in the course of the Reformation, even as he mutates some of his views. For instance, temporal authority, to what extent it should be obeyed, etc. And then a, a really excellent document that is just a tour de force both a defense of the Lutheran Two Kingdoms doctrine and also an exoneration of the attacks against it, where it's blamed for Nazism, etc., is uh, Uvi Simonetto's um, fabricated Luther, refuting Nazi connections and other modern myths. Uh, he throughout deals with the Two Kingdoms teaching and in the context of the accusations against Luther. Another, finally, another final, fine uh, book is Tyranny and Resistance, Magdeburg Confession. It's often believed, of course, in the wake of World War II, that the Lutheran Kingdoms, Two Kingdoms dogma, and Luther just said, you must blindly obey government, come what may, and there was no, there was no right of rebelling in any fashion, and it's long been said that basically the idea of revolt against tyranny is merely uh, is, is a particularly reformed idea, and the opposite is taught in Lutheranism. Well, the Magdeburg Confession in the 1550s demonstrates very clearly that it was in standing against the emperor, fighting for the right of a free conscience to confess, believe, and act uh, in a Lutheran fashion in life, Magdeburgers, who withstood the emperor, uh, enunciated the kingdom's doctrine, which allowed for revolt uh, based upon tyranny by the emperor. And so it was precisely from the Lutherans that the reform, that is Beza and others, received this teaching which found its way, and it's a complicated road, But, and I probably threw a bomb in the midst of us by doing this, but found its way all the way to Thomas Jefferson. Very fascinating connection and well worth a read. I want to just today concentrate upon the text of the Book of Concord, the Augsburg Confession behooves us today to be clear on this and to understand it. Article 16. The Augsburg Confession was presented in 1530 at the Diet of Augs Augsburg, the Reichstag, where all the political leaders of the world came together, the, the Western world and Europe came together to deal with pressing issues of the day. And of course, uh, the issue of what to do against Suleiman and the Turkish Empire was always on the docket uh, for those decades of the Reformation, and at, in fact kept the uh, emperor at bay and allowed the Lutherans space to actually develop and defend themselves. 1530, uh, the Augsburg Confession was penned. Uh, Melanchthon wrote it, but Luther said, it's mine. Luther was under the ban so he could be taken captive and killed as a heretic, so he had to stay in Saxony at the Coburg Castle while Melanchthon and the others were over in Augsburg. And some of the greatest letters Luther ever wrote to, were to Melanchthon in this period, and they're very compelling reading, very full of consolation. And you could tell Luther is just beside himself not being able to take part in the action and have to wait for letters coming back and forth. But Article 16 on Civil Government. Our churches teach that lawful civil, civil regulations are good works of God. They teach that it is right for Christians to hold political office, serve as judges, to judge matters by imperial laws and other existing laws, to impose just punishments, to engage in just wars, serve as soldiers, make legal contracts, 
hold property, to take oaths when required by the magistrates, for a man to marry a wife or a woman to be given in marriage. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists who forbid these political offices to Christians. Now, there were basically three approaches to church and state at the time. The first was the medieval Roman Catholic approach, which believed that all authority, including government authority, proceeded out of the church. So that was based upon a bogus document called the Donation of Constantine, where allegedly the emperor received from the pope his authority to govern the world. It was shown to be a false document about the time of Luther, and he knew of that uh, Vala's challenge to it. The second approach was the approach of uh, the Anabaptist or the Reformed. On the one hand, the approach was either this, that the Bible must be radically followed such that uh, the Bible tells me I cannot have anything to do with the state. That was the position of the Anabaptists, and we have that position exercised today, of course, among the Amish. And uh, you have that tradition among pacifists of the Reformed camp to this day. The other trend, uh, on the other hand, by the Reformed, was to basically not withdraw from the culture, society, but actually to say that the culture and society must be ruled by the Bible, the law of Moses and other precepts in the Bible. Uh, the Lutherans, that is called an exclusively biblical model by some. Lutherans had a sort of magisterial or inclusively biblical approach in Luther's two kingdoms. The divine realm and the temporal realm are both uh, God's orders. They are established by God, but they have different purposes. Kingdom of the left hand or the state emanating from the family uh, is ruled by reason and uh, natural law, especially. And we can see that the Ten Commandments agree with natural law. Uh, the other kingdom of the right, the church, is a matter of grace. There's no compelling. There's no forcing grace. There's no coercion. On the kingdom of the left, it operates by coercion. If you break the law, you are going to be coerced. You are going to be forced to do certain things. It's just the way that kingdom works. The big problem that Luther confronted and continued to confront in various ways, but the problem was the meddling of church in state affairs. There are many famous incidences of that through the history of the church. And also the state meddling in the affairs of the church. So we as Lutherans must be very careful in our context. We don't want to meddle in the affairs of the state in such a way that we, as the church, give directives to the state to act in certain ways which are demanded in the Bible. Uh, we have to recognize that we have limits on uh, what the church has to say to the state. And on the other hand, we don't want the state meddling in the church's business. So, when we go to the state and make a case, we will indeed uh, make a case based on the scriptures to individuals who are Lutherans, say, are Christians on the hill, and there are many of them, and I have a the great chance to meet them all the time. We will make the case biblically for various things, but we must demand that the state operate according to natural law. And it operate according to reason, which, when reason is functioning properly, agrees completely with the scriptures and its morality. We must demand of the state, too, that the state uh, provide protection for the church. It is insanity for a state to hinder the life of a church in its activities. 
I testified in Congress a couple of years ago, the Missouri Synod is a machine, and so are uh, many, many other churches. We are machines to produce good citizens who follow the laws, who obey authority, who pay their taxes, who work, etc., who have families. Number one determiner of poverty is single motherhood, but we encourage families, we encourage adoption, all those kinds of things. It's insane sanity for the state to turn its uh, coercive powers on the church and hinder its work. And secondarily, anything by the state that hinders the gospel must be rejected out of hand, out of conscience, and we must uh, obey God rather than men. Confession goes on. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists who forbid these political offices to Christians. They also condemn those who do not locate evangelical evangelical perfection in the fear of God and in faith, but place it in forsaking political offices. So, and in the context, there were those who believed that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount really didn't apply to everybody. It applied only to those who wished to be more holy than the rest, uh, the monks. These were evangelical councils above and beyond the regular law for people. So when Jesus says, uh, do not resist one who is evil uh, instead of eye for an eye or love your enemies, those kind of statements, he wasn't addressing those to everybody, but really only to the super holy who would spend less time in purgatory and could help others get less time in purgatory too through their own actions. Of course, uh, Luther famously rejected that interpretation and said what Jesus is talking about in these hard passages in the Sermon on the Mount is the heart of the Christian. It is the uh, the inner disposition of the Christian in going about life. But Jesus is not forbidding warfare. Jesus is not forbidding uh, justice. He's not forbidding courts. He's not forbidding uh, legal apparatus. Uh, all those He's not forbidding people to be soldiers. And we know that very clearly because when, for instance, John the Baptizer confronts soldiers, what does he tell them to do? He doesn't tell them stop being soldiers. He says, be honest. And think of the numerous centurions that are mentioned in the Bible. Nobody's ever told not to be a soldier. Think of Cornelius, for instance, in Acts chapter 10. Uh, Nobody who's a soldier is ever told not to be a soldier. Nobody who's a magistrate is told not to be a magistrate. It's never described as something that is inherently wrong or sinful. And then we have uh, the magnificent passage of Romans 13, which we may look at in a bit. God and in faith, but uh, for the gospel teaches an eternal righteousness of the heart, Romans 10.10. 10. The question says, at the same time, it does not require the destruction of the civil state or the family. The gospel very much requires that they be preserved as God's ordinances and that love be practiced in such ordinances. Therefore, it is necessary for Christians to be obedient to their rulers and laws. The only exception is when they are commanded to sin. Then they ought to obey God rather than men, Acts 5.29. This is elaborated, then, in the apology to the Augsburg Confession. Philip Melanchthon followed up with a confession in 1531, which is in our Book of Concord. And this became, likewise, in 1580, a universal confession of the Lutheran Church. And this is an authority for us. Article 16 in the apology is still short. It's only about two pages, but it's longer than the original article. Uh, Melanchthon writes, The adversaries accept Article 16 without exception. In it, we have confessed that it is lawful for the Christian to hold public office, sit in judgment, determine matters by the imperial laws and other laws currently in force, set just punishments, engage in just wars, act as a soldier, make legal contracts, hold property, take an oath when public officials require it, and contract marriage. Finally, we have confessed that legitimate public ordinances are good creations of God and divine ordinances which a Christian can safely use. We could say very uh, easily that 
the confession says when it's a legitimate public ordinance, a lawful public ordinance, public ordinance which is contrary to natural law or contrary to the Ten Commandments, uh, must not uh, is not a legitimate authority, and to that extent may be and must be resisted by Christians, but uh, through the means given us. This entire topic about the distinction between spiritual kingdom of Christ and a political kingdom has been explained in the literature of our writers. Christ's kingdom is spiritual. So Jesus tells Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. This means that the knowledge of God, the fear of God and faith, eternal righteousness, and eternal life begin in the heart. Meanwhile, Christ's kingdom allows us outwardly to use legitimate political ordinances of every nation in which we live, just as it allows us to use medicine or the art of building or food or drink and air. So, for instance, communism is contrary to both the Bible and natural law. Not merely because it's atheistic, but because it believes that property must be held in common. Well, the Bible has something called the Seventh Commandment, Thou shalt not steal, which presupposes that people own property, people work, people are paid. It's everywhere in the Bible. And so, but if Christians, which they do, find themselves in countries with these kind of, uh, with a communist system, for instance, which reaches right into private life to a certain extent, uh, Christians may obey authorities in that state so far as those authorities uphold legitimate law, natural law, and they can do so without a bad conscience. Confession continues. Neither does the gospel offer new laws about the public state, but commands that we obey present laws, whether they have been framed by heathens or by others. This is wonderful. We can step into the public square as Christians, and we can work at framing laws with anybody. Laws which are reasonable and work for good. And we should partner, as Lutherans, we are very free to partner with whoever it may be to work for good, civic good, which God loves. The confession continues. It commands that in this ordinance we should exercise love. Karlstadt, Karlstadt is the guy who took over when Luther uh, was in the Wartburg Castle hiding after he made his great Here I Stand speech. Karlstadt took over and just made a mess of everything. He was the precursor of the Anabaptist movement. Karlstadt was crazy to impose on us Moses' judicial laws. Uh, the Lutherans are very careful to ask whenever they interpret the Bible, who said this? And to whom were they speaking? And to what extent does it apply to us today? Our theologians have written more fully about these subjects. They have done so because the monks spread many deadly poison opinions in the church. They called holding property in common the governance of the gospel. They said that not holding property or not acquitting oneself at law were evangelical counsels, as though these were extra things done for the, by the super holy. These opinions greatly cloud over the gospel and the spiritual kingdom and are dangerous to the commonwealth. The gospel does not destroy the state or the family, but rather approves them and asks us to obey them as a divine ordinance, not only because of punishment, but also because of conscience. And the reason, the way conscience is used here by the confession. The confession does not talk about a bad conscience. When we think about conscience, we usually think about uh, having a bad conscience about something we did. Uh, in this case, what Melanchthon means, and he explains this in his commentary on Romans, is that when we act contrary, willfully contrary to good and legitimate legal ordinances, by doing so, we drive out faith, and the Holy Spirit. Therefore, our Christian conscience is bad in the sense that it ceases to function. Julian the Apostate, Celsus, and many others objected to Christians 
that the gospel would tear states apart because it forbade legal remedy and taught certain other things, ill-suited to political association. These, of course, were ancient writers who were attacking Christianity for attacking the state, allegedly. Origen, Gregory Nazianzus, and others wonderfully worked on these questions. However, they can be easily explained if we keep this in mind. The gospel does not introduce laws about the public state, but is the forgiveness of sins and the beginning of a new life in the hearts of believers. Besides, the gospel not only approves outward governments, but also subjects us to them, Romans 13. Now, we should just take a quick look at Romans 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority. And by the way, the word authority here is the same word uh, which is used in the kingdom of the right for uh, Jesus, when the text says, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. I suppose that's all authority as God, rather. Exousia, there's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. Those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good contact, but to bad. Here's the proviso. This cuts both ways. Christian is to be subject to government, on the one hand. On the other hand, government is to be subject to to good, to reason, to good laws. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. When government goes bad, we do what is good, and we receive fight, opposition, difficulty. Then it goes on, Paul goes on to say, For he is God's servant. Paul uses the word diakonos, the same word used for the office of the ministry, for instance, just generically a servant. He is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. If you do wrong. For he is the servant of God. Again, diakonos. An avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. And the word subjection here is just that New Testament word, hypotasso, which means uh, under authority. Because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. And the word minister there is extra, actually lighter goes, uh, it's uh, the word we get for liturgy, which is a public service. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, Revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. So Romans 13 cuts both ways. It presupposes uh, you know, that the rulers are going to be operating rationally. Now the different kinds, back to the confession, now the different kinds of public remedy are legal decisions, capital punishment. I'm sorry, I, I started a little lower than I should have. Back. Back to the earlier paragraph. In a similar way, we have been necessarily placed under the laws of seasons, changes of winter and summer, as divine ordinances. The gospel forbids private remedy. What the confession says here is, uh, when the gospel says you should uh, not act with any revenge to your neighbor, when Jesus gives these counsels in the Sermon on the Mount, He's talking about taking matters into your own hands. He's not taking, talking about condemning uh, legal recourse. Christ instills this often so that the apostles do not think they should seize the governments from those who held otherwise, just as Jewish people dreamed about the kingdom of the Messiah. That is, that there would be some worldly, earthly kingdom I would rule. Christ did this so that the apostles might know they should teach that the spiritual kingdom does not change the public state. Therefore, private remedy is prohibited not by advice, but by a command. Public remedy made through the office of the public official is not condemned, but is con commanded and is God's work, according to Paul. Now, the different kinds of public remedy are legal decisions, capital punishment, wars, military service, Clearly, many writers have thought wrongly about these matters. They were in error, etc. 
gospel brings eternal righteousness. Oh, I'm just about at the the end of this uh, section. I hope I haven't bored you uh, interminably uh, with this, but I've been told that it's time to switch course and carry on with Tim Gagline to have a, a conversation. Thanks, Tim. President Harrison, thank you so much. Very far from boring. That was extremely enlightening and uh, and really absolutely excellent. Uh, just just great, actually. Um, uh, just as, as moderator, if I may take the license for the first question. Um, in the present cultural moment that we all find ourselves in as Lutheran Christians uh, who are blessed to live in the United States, it seems to me that we must all honestly acknowledge uh, the moral revolution in public sentiment in our own time. Uh, it's becoming increasingly uh, libertine uh, in its uh, sensibility and consequently more affirming of many of those things that we as, uh, as Lutheran Christians uh, believe to be disorder. And, uh, and so in the present state of affairs, in the real world, applying uh, all the things that you have just uh, shared with us and taught us, um, we have a potential Supreme Court case um, where the government may sue the little sisters of the poor, uh, a ministry uh, of Catholic nuns. A lot of us never thought we would live long enough to see the government uh, bringing a lawsuit against 75 nuns over the issue of conscience. Uh, we may have another uh, homosexual marriage case in the Supreme Court uh, in this term. Uh, for those of us who are joining today in the states of South Carolina and Kansas, President Harrison, just yesterday, we had major rulings uh, on same-sex marriage. Um, so uh, what I'm saying is that in this moral revolution we're living in, a lot of us are asking, how do we actually apply in 21st century uh, America the principles you know, from the Bible uh, as articulated and systematized by the great Martin Luther? In other words, how do we take everything that you have just shared with us and taught us, how do we, how do we apply that, practically speaking, uh, as men and women in the church, to this bevy of, of issues that are truly uh, you know, challenging us you know, seemingly every day in the public square. I think withdrawal would be completely wrong, be akin to the Anabaptist approach. Uh, we must participate. We must participate in governments throughout the ages, wherever Christians have dealt with it, have never been as it were, Christian. They've never, as it were, sort of acted with complete moral integrity. There's always a struggle with conscience, and that's understood because governments work with compulsion, with uh, political majorities, minorities, force, sometimes tyranny, and those kind of things. We can't step back. We must participate. But now it's clear. What, what is so damaging about the left today is that as a result of evolutionism and uh, a number of other things, there is no belief in natural law. That is, if we are the result of uh, chance, then all of human life, all of its mores are simply constructs thought up by certain people at certain times. And those constructs may be changed according to the whim or viewpoint of people at any given time. That is something that we as Christians both on the basis of natural law and reason. We reject it on the clear basis of the scriptures, which also teach natural law. So we must continue to be engaged. Our engagement will change now. It is, uh, it is a defensive game, and I, I like to say we're, we're establishing this Washington office for an aggressive defense. That is, we will aggressively defend our First Amendment constitutional right to the free exercise of religion. That's what we must do. Uh, a number of, uh, of um, people have uh, said uh, sort of cleverly in the public square that uh, Christians for most of the history of the United States, uh, that is to say, in the living memory of, of probably most of the people on this webinar, 
um, that although it wasn't articulated as such, uh, that you know, when you were a Christian living in America, you were on the proverbial home team. And, uh, and, and given the shift in the culture, uh, this is certainly not original with me, but a number of people said increasingly we're no longer the home team, we're the away team. Uh, again, how to apply to the two kingdoms? Are we, are we to think of ourselves as, as sort of cultural you know, exiles in our own country? Well, there is, in these last times, it is reminiscent of this section there on turning ourselves as foreigners, sojourners in life. We are indeed. Um, the framers had, the framers of the Constitution had a marvelous and new consonant with many aspects of the Lutheran Two Kingdoms. They had a, a view that the church and at their time of course they accepted a a amount of pluralism there was religious freedom uh, the great majority were christians of course but they realized as reasonable leaders even um, jefferson was quite clear on this that not only did natural law exist but also that the church was the most helpful agent for society Washington famously said it takes a moral people to operate under our form of government. The church performs, the church provides moral people. I think a great failure of mostly Protestantism, but all Christians in America basically, and I, and I would say uh, mainline, old line Protestantism failed because of historical criticism especially, which took away the authority of the scriptures, which undermined moral authority, etc. So, yes, oh, we will feel like strangers increasingly, and so it goes. Luther said that the gospel comes and waters a place, and then for thanklessness it passes away. And we see in our time the gospel passing from America. The Lord is allowing it to move to the south. Now, this is where he has put us. There are many of us who confess the faith here, and many more will confess because of the gospel and believe. We will not give up. But uh, we are strangers here. Nevertheless, roll up your sleeves and go to work. Uh, Carol from uh, San Jose uh, sent a note to President Harrison, uh, and I think it's a wonderful note. She says, uh, what, what, what encouragement does scripture offer for this time? I'm, I'm so glad that she uh, reminds us that despair and discouragement is a sin uh, because it negates hope. And I, I love this, this wonderfully hopeful uh, question. What encouragement does scripture uh, offer for this time? I would just encourage you to grab your book of Romans, look at chapter one and two, and you see that uh, in the Roman Empire, things were hardly different. And then I would look at chapter 3, and I would claim your part, our part in the problem. We are sinners all, all of us. Romans chapter 4 and uh, offers the 3 and 4, offers the remedy for our sin. Christ is for us. The eternal game is done. Uh, the deed is done. The once-for-all act happened 8,000 miles away, 2,000 years ago. It's a done deal for us. Then go to chapter 5. Perseverance in the midst of challenges produces hope. Chapter 5 is full of hope. Grab hold of your baptism in chapter 6. We're buried with Christ. Uh, and then uh, know that your struggles with conscience and challenges of falling short and that will all happen in spades because of our world today. And how do we interact with it? Chapter 7, the good that I would, I do not. So who shall rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God. And then I'd go to chapter 8 for the coup de grace. All things work together for good. Don't doubt it. Wonderful. Thank you, Carol. Um, Reverend Mark Meyer um, uh, asked, a wonderful question. Did I miss comments on the Sixth Circuit ruling supporting traditional definition of marriage? What a perfect question, uh, President Harrison, in light of your comments, because the Sixth Circuit is the first major senior appellate court in the United States uh, to have uh, ruled in opposition to the Supreme Court. 
the Sixth Circuit, by a ruling of two to one, uh, determined that, in fact, marriage uh, is uh, between a man and a woman, which is to say uh, the, the, uh, the appellate judges in that case uh, decided uh, that there is no uh, constitutional um, uh, you know, support, necessarily constitutional support for marriage uh, between people of the same sex. Uh, so this is the first major senior appellate court uh, to rule in favor of marriage. There have been dissenting judges in, in federal court who have uh, supported uh, the LCMS view on marriage, but this is the first majority opinion, uh, and I'm very glad that, uh, that Pastor uh, Meyer uh, raised that question, and, and we're, we're happy, uh, happy to share that. Um, I want to go to a question, if I may, from, from Adrian Hines from Missouri, uh, our friend Adrian. She says, how do we encourage our young Lutherans? And I'm glad she's getting to this question, President Harrison, of the millennials, where you yourself uh, have invested a lot of your time and, and of your own uh, uh, presidency at the Missouri Senate in this rising generation of young people. They're, they're half of all Americans, but they're 100% of our future. Um, and she says, um, how do we encourage these young millennial Lutherans to speak about the issues when they are hearing the exact opposite from their peers and in academia? This is a wonderful question. Uh, the overwhelming majority of people in the millennial generation tell the most reliable pollsters uh, that the majority of millennials support same-sex marriage. So how do, we, how do we address Adrian's question? How do we encourage our young Lutherans who sometimes have to stand outside uh, what the majority opinion says? Yeah, well, I, I think I'll, I'll quote a great American who was agitating against uh, slavery. I would say, agitate, 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 Frederick Douglass. Uh, we must not grow weary. We must teach, 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 challenge young people, invite them in, give them opportunities to uh, see how government works, to see how the church works, invite them into uh, service, rec help them recognize their vocations. Now, I, I am not optimistic about the Supreme Court, as you well know. I think uh, Kennedy may be looking for the opportunity to go down in history. And when basically every uh, issue falls to a libertarian Roman Catholic, uh, in this case, thank God for the other Catholics on the Supreme Court, uh, there are problems. So I'm not optimistic. But it is parallel to Roe v. Wade. In many ways, the courts have irresponsibly ruled against state after state after state after state's vote of the public, overwhelming in many cases, vote of the public, constitutional amendments approved by states. These have been overturned in state after state after state. This is a, a very unfortunate intrusion, a violation of uh, natural law, a violation of the scriptures, and uh, so it has also not allowed the public actually to wrestle through this issue and work as a democracy. That right was also robbed of this country in 1973 with Roe v. Wade. So uh, we are now entering a period where our, our arguments will change, our actions will be adjusted, our approach will change depending on what kind of attacks we have. And we're in a very challenging situation. You know, the church is the place, uh, we are the place of love and concern. We don't regard any sins as worse than other sins. And yet this issue seems to strike at us and hit us at all of our weak points. And in the midst of that, the Lord is by our side. May I say, President Harrison, this is the wonderful thing about being a Missouri Synod Lutheran, that we have been uh, part, parcel, foundational to the uh, to the pro-life movement from its very beginning. And to connect what you said a moment ago to, to Adrienne's wonderful point uh, in her question or, or, or in her comment, you know, the, the pro-life movement succeeded in large measure and is succeeding in large measure for two big reasons. Uh, one, uh, uh, early leaders in the pro-life movement, the prominent Missouri Synod Lutherans among them, made the intellectual case uh, for the pro-life movement. Uh, this does not negate theology, but it, but it casts the net wide, and it, and, it, and, and it says that 
persuasion as a method and a goal is really uh, is really a good uh, you know is good public policy. It's very consonant with the two kingdoms. We have to make the intellectual fermentation um, of our, of our case. Uh, to those who shape and form um, uh, the broader public opinion, uh, but more, you know, just as importantly, maybe more importantly, the Missouri Synod um, has led in, in our compassionate ministry to women. So it's both intellectual ferment uh, and being part of the dialogue, being a part of the public policy debate, as you have outlined in your wonderful comments this morning, but also in the mercy part of it, which is where you began, President Harris. And we must always remember that there aren't super sins uh, and that we are compassionate to these women at the most organic local level. And it seems to me that among millennials, uh, uh, that they are going to have to be part of building a new uh, pro-marriage movement, uh, just as the, uh, the, the abolitionists, the anti-slavery, the civil rights movement, the pro-life movement, all these great movements which would not have existed uh, without Christianity at the center, it seems to me that we're on the cusp of potentially having to build, you know, a, a, a new civil rights movement uh, that, but but that uh, understands that that one man and one uh, woman in marriage uh, is good public policy. Uh, I'd love to have your comments in that regard. Oh, you're absolutely right. Who would have guessed him in 1973 that young people today would be uh, overwhelmingly pro-life? Nobody. So, but it does mean we're going to have a, a ragged edge to live on. And that's just our calling in the world. Uh, yes, it is. Um, President Harris, I'm being mindful of time. Let me ask another question, if I may. Uh, uh, Barb uh, from St. Louis says, how do you encourage us to be actively defending the faith in our local communities? Uh, I'm, I'm, again, a very important question. You know, uh, a very famous liberal Democrat once said that all politics is local. Uh, to modify, all good theology is local. Uh, how you know? How do you speak directly to those people who are joining us this morning, President Harrison, um, who are in local parishes? Uh, some of them are very small. Some of them are medium-sized. Some of them are large. But but local, local, local. How do uh, people defend the faith in our local communities at the most local, basic level? What is your best counsel uh, to people of goodwill? Say number one, become educated study the scriptures and the Luther Confessions and some of the writings that I've given you and there are infinite other possibilities. Two, look for opportunities to be politically involved and involved in your community in helpful ways on the kingdom of the left. It can be also in a myriad of ways. The kingdom of the left is a place where, which takes care of neighborhoods, uh, all kinds of challenges at schools, uh, needy people, etc involved in those areas. You, you as a Christian have an obligation and also the great freedom to operate in those left-hand kingdom issues for the betterment of your community. I think, you know, I think of all the literally tens of thousands, and I'm sure it is, teachers trained by our Missouri Synod universities who are right now teaching in public institutions for good as Christians, and that is just fantastic. So, and then I would say, make sure your church is involved in, uh, in opportunities for mercy to those who struggle the most with our, our modern challenges. Uh, David Roth Hughes uh, from the United States uh, says, as ministers and teachers of our congregation, how should we speak to issues regarding death with dignity, especially when we hear passionate testimonies from the likes of Brittany Maynard uh, trying to distance the movement from suicide? Uh, it's true that the, that the Maynard case has been uh, everywhere, President Harrison. This is a very timely and, and important question. Great place to start is to go to the video produced by Maggie Carner, K-A-R-N-E-R, Find it on the LCMS website, www.lcms.org. Maggie made a video for an organization in New England, Great King of the Left video, which doesn't argue on the basis of the Bible, but argues from reason for not uh, for Brittany to have not uh, ended her life as she did. Maggie offers a very powerful argument there. At the same time. Uh, get in touch with Maggie's the head of our LCMS life. Get in touch with us. 
got a lot of resources in this regard to help articulate the cause. Uh, President Harrison, we have just a time, uh, if I may, for or, uh, two more questions, and I'll make them very quickly. Uh, one is um, uh, another question, and, and I've seen these kind of running throughout our chat today, about encouraging people to, to actively defend the faith in their local communities, to be true uh, to the faith itself. Uh, you know, for, for many people, this seems basic, and yet in the time that we are in, it is anything but basic. So uh, in the, one of the two last uh, questions I'd like to ask you, what about uh, the way that we are to, to, you know, actively defend the faith in our local communities, not just on the issues that we're talking about, but, uh, you know, to be great servants to Christ and to our neighbors. How do you think about that? I guess it's time. Uh, actually, the whole discipline of apologetics is overwhelmingly significant. John Warwick Montgomery just spoke at my own congregation at an event we had for the community last week, and there were a number of non LCMS people and non-Christian people who came for his a lawyer's defense of Christianity. So uh, the whole realm of apologetics becomes ever more significant. Our campus ministries are well into this, have been for quite some time. It's a very unifying force for us. And I think, frankly, the external forces upon Christianity will not only draw all Christians closer together, it will also have a positive effect at drawing the Missouri Synod into a greater sense of unity. So good will come. I think the last point uh, is one that a friend of mine uh, shared this morning. Uh, he is at the Southern Baptist Convention and has uh, great regard for the Missouri Synod. Um, he, uh, he, he pens in an essay that, uh, uh, that, that sometimes we feel like a church in, in cultural exile, but he says that we are not a church in retreat. Uh, that, you know, that this is a wonderful juxtaposition. Um, he says that we're learning to, di to disagree well uh, with those uh, in our great country uh, on very big issues, but that uh, we must, while disagreeing well, uh, not concede our principles. Um, he says that we are seeing a shift in tone and in language, but never in principle, uh, because uh, we, we want to serve and, and love others and ultimately to have the door open to share the gospel. And I think, President Harrison, that, that you have modeled this kind of convictional uh, kindness as our guide, uh, and, th and that is to your great, to, to your, to your great uh, credit. The point I want to end on is what about tone and style? Uh, what about the way that we are to actually speak in the public square? Um, it's so tempting when we feel that we are most uh, under siege uh, to react and to use words and language that don't reflect our Lord and Savior. It seems to me that tone and tempo and style uh, in the way that you and others have modeled it would seem to be more important now than ever. Uh, is that the case? And, and if so, why is that important? I think so. It, it's so easy for us to communicate in ways that can really undercut our cause, and we all do it from time to time. We're also free to communicate on the web and many other places. We must be consistent. We must be kind. We must be loving to all. We speak well of people wherever we can. We're criticizing our government or government officials. We must be praying for them. I think if you're not praying, you have no right to speak as a citizen, really, from a Christian. We're praying weekly in our churches for our all elected officials and our justices. And uh, we should engage. We've got to be present. You've just got to show up. Uh, three-fourths of the game is showing up. Yes, a friend of mine referred to it as a ministry of presence, and it seems to me without being a presence in the public square, uh, as you have outlined in your vision for the Missouri Synod, uh, it, it would be difficult uh, in, in very serious degrees uh, to be involved uh, very much uh, in, these, in these issues. President Harrison, so thank you. So many of our wonderful pastors and lay people are active and they are present. And I, I'm so proud when I see some of them elected to high office. That is just an amazing. These, uh, all of us, let's pray for especially our LCMS brothers and sisters who are in significant positions. 
has been very heartening for me the last few years to find not only you, Tim Gagline, who are, is indefatigable on all these issues, but there's a whole cadre of young LCMS folks in D.C. who are staffers and work for various entities and organizations who are fantastic. I, I have to say I believe very uh, strongly uh, that you are exactly right, uh, that they may be in the minority, but we have a, a, a remarkable uh, calvary of, um, of, um, of young uh, LCMS Christians who are passionate for Jesus Christ, and they're passionate about the public square uh, here in Washington, in the other cultural capital, New York, uh, Washington, et cetera, uh, and uh, Los Angeles, other places. So President Harrison, thank you so much. Uh, for uh, joining us on this last uh, webcast uh, of this calendar year. Uh, to those who have been regular participants, we look forward to having you join us again uh, at the turn of the new year. Uh, we wish everybody a most blessed Thanksgiving and Advent and Christmas season on the cusp. And with that, I'm happy to turn it back to my uh, great friend, uh, Barb Below, and again, thanking uh, President Matthew Harrison uh, for his time this morning, Barb. Okay, thank you, Tim and President Harrison and everyone for participating today. We invite you to join us again at the next Free to Be Faithful webinar that's scheduled for Tuesday, March 10th um, next year, Tuesday, March 10th um, at 10 a.m. Eastern or 9 a.m. Central Time. Our speaker on the next webinar will be Wesley Smith. He's the Senior Fellow at the Discovery Institute in Seattle and is one of the nation's experts on bioethics, euthanasia, and physician-assisted suicide. Today's webinar will be posted online at www.lcms.org forward slash free to be faithful, and you'll be able to find this video and archives of previous webinars on that website, you'll find other good resources regarding um, being Lutheran in the public square and all sorts of other resources about the Free to Be Faithful campaign. Again, that's www.lcms.org forward slash free to be faithful. And thanks everyone for participating today and have a wonderful rest of the day. God bless.